No. So this is my name is Sunil. I work with uh, Reporting House, and today we'll be talking about SAP PM uh, and data analysis and reporting. So. Uh, We'll just go through some of the data analysis issues. Uh, what are the options for SAP PM, EM, uh, and uh, for reporting purposes, what the limitations are, and then we'll talk about how data-driven solutions for EM business problems. And then I'll share some of the examples that uh, we all can use. Uh, before uh, we go, uh, we have a small question. Uh, here we Eric, go. Can you, yeah. Sure can. Um, what version of SAP CMMS do you currently use? Is it the version known as PM or plant maintenance, or are you on a newer version that they're calling EAM? And I'll just give Sunil an opportunity to know kind of where everybody is. And we're going to give it five more seconds. And then we'll close the poll. And we'll report on it. And Sunil, 94% are using PM or plant maintenance. All right. All 6 percent right. on this call are using EAM. Okay, got it. So typically, let's go through some of the business challenges that, uh, as an enterprise asset management, we all face. Uh, there are different personas within organizations uh, that are responsible or directly or indirectly related to enterprise asset management. Uh, upper management, managers, EM administrators, SAP administrators, and then of course the staff and the shop floor uh, people as well as uh, sometimes reliability analysts. And they all have different set of uh, uh, problems that they are trying to, uh, to sort out. Uh, they want to understand the asset utilization, service availability, and uh, reliability. So most of the upper management obviously wants to monitor total cost of uh, asset ownership, uh, maintenance cost, uh, getting timely alerts uh, on critical issues, events. And uh, most of us, we all also have spare parts inventory that we would ideally like to optimize and what are ways we can optimize. So everybody's looking for ways to optimizing spare parts inventory. Uh, and at a, again, at a higher level, we are also looking to increase the overall return on the investments in the assets. Uh, people would like to make uh, budgeting decisions based on the information that they can get uh, from the SAP PM. And then there are some other aspects, uh, and this is no way uh, we are, I'm touching all the business challenges, but a broad area. Um, some of the things that we observed most of the EM decision makers have a dilemma with is understanding where to focus maintenance efforts, allocating resources to high value opportunities, where should we actually focus and uh, where will we get the maximum uh, benefit out of our efforts. We are also looking for, uh, the decision makers are also looking for uh, if they have implemented a new process or they have uh, changed a process in a particular way, they would like to see and monitor uh, the improvement of, uh, you know, on the results out of that change. We are also looking for, uh, you know, there are a lot of initiatives in the organization that we all uh, may have, like uh, predictive maintenance, condition-based maintenance, RCM, or there could be a lot of other smaller initiatives. and. Uh, we would like to see whether we are getting any results out of it and keep monitoring the progress on those efforts and uh, see how we can uh, all improve. Uh, then, of course, if you have multi-site type of situation where you would like to benchmark performance, and that kind of gives us the opportunity to figure out uh, what what we can learn from each other from different sites, etc. And uh, Overall, you know, we all have some sort of strategies uh, in improvement uh, at, a, at a corporate level and want to kind of understand what, how to define those strategies. And of course, once the strategy is in, uh, is in execution mode, you would like to monitor uh, how it is being implemented. So generally what we have seen, the value of uh, enterprise asset management data analysis, so we all, if, implemented SAP with the intent that, of course, we want to overcome uh, the operational uh, issues and manage all the work orders, manage all the uh, 
uh, different types of items, assets, spare parts, all of that. But uh, really, from a broad angle, SAP is gathering so much data and all other asset-related uh, information as gathering data. So most of the time, SAP at the base level, whatever we get, uh, actually gives most of the time what has really happened, what we call it as a baseline reporting. So as if you see the, as the information becomes a little bit more sophisticated, raw data is converted into information and can be analyzed further, then we would know really why something happened. We'll get an insight on a particular problem. And that will help us make uh, some informed decisions. And as you can see, the value will increase as as you were, your your information sophistication becomes uh, uh, useful, and you will know that uh, the idea is to know what might come, get some early alerts, get some uh, some problem areas that you can find out, and then act on it. So, really, as you progress, uh, the what will happen will help you avoid some obvious issues. So. Terry, I have another question. Okay. If you are not currently on SAP EAM, when do you plan to upgrade to EAM? That in zero to six months, in six to twelve months, in twelve to twenty-four months, or longer than twenty-four months? And that would be one if you were not sure whether you were going to upgrade as well. And we'll take about five more seconds. I'll share the results. We're going to close and close. Sunil, 12% um, on this web workshop are going to upgrade within zero to six months, so it's eminent for them. 6% are from six to 12 months from now. 12% 12 are 12 to 24 months from now, but by far the largest block is greater than 24 months. Okay. That's right. 71%. So really, uh, the, the purpose of this is want to learn what your options are from a data analysis perspective. So we'll talk more about it as we go along. We have seen, you know, a lot of times SAP gathers a lot of, we collect a lot of data within SAP, but somehow we don't really leverage on it, and we don't really rely on it to make all our decisions. It's kind of used for more of an operational type of uh, decision making, not necessarily tactical or a strategic decision making. And by far, we have seen some of these reasons why we rely less on data. Um, a lot of times, organizations have evolved over the years. Uh, so the leadership is, is really doesn't uh, uh, have that culture of making uh, data-driven decisions. So leadership is a, is a very, very important that, uh, aspect that we see why people don't rely. Uh, other problem we have seen is a lack of knowledge on how data can be leveraged. And we have a lot of situations where people on the shop floor, they just don't know why they are entering the data and how that data can be used in making informed decisions. So we found the, uh, the lack of you know, understanding on how that data can be used uh, is, a, is another reason why there is a little reluctance on poor data quality, and that's another very big issue, which is uh, the data quality inside SAP is is good to the extent that they understand what uh, whatever they are going to use. But if they are not using it, sometimes the quality is not as good uh, in terms of accuracy, consistency, completeness, integrity, and and hence uh, it's a it's a it's a chicken and egg story where. Since data is not good, we don't rely on the report and or uh, and on analysis, and that whole culture never gets built. Uh, the other problem we have seen is the taxonomy and standardization uh, doesn't exist. So if you have asset hierarchy, uh, a good asset hierarchy can really help. Uh, so sometimes that doesn't exist, or a component hierarchy, or any of these normal a standardized naming convention or grouping convention, if it doesn't exist, then it, it becomes very difficult to analyze data. Um, and a lot of times, companies have other priorities, other methodologies uh, that they are engaged in. They have budget issues. And overall, you know, that kind of leads to rely more on to the, uh, on to people's experience and uh, just uh, go with, use data as and when uh, 
it's it's convenient. It's not really everything they they rely on the data alone. So it becomes kind of that culture uh, is another issue, as I said earlier. So uh, I have another question, Terry. Okay. Please um, rate the quality and integrity of your SAP data in terms of accuracy, consistency, and completeness. In other words, would you describe your SAP data as very good, good, poor, or very poor? Let me give it five more seconds. And well, got the majority of people um, sharing on that particular one. Very interesting. Nobody rated themselves very good. Nobody rated themselves very poor. 53% uh, said it's good. 47% said it's poor. And I have a feeling those two are pretty. Um, there's a thin line separating those. Is it would be my feeling. Uh, actually, this uh, this is no different than what we have actually uh, what I've seen uh, in the in the practical uh, uh, in in actual uh, users. Um, there is good data in some parts of the uh, SAP, but sometimes it may not be complete or it may not be uh, accurate in some play, some uh, some instances. So yeah, I think uh, I was just trying to see how how are they feeling. Uh, and that's really one of the big uh, issue that we feel that uh, in standardization uh, can really help uh, in, uh, in in analyzing the data. So having a good asset hierarchy, uh, and this is just an example. You may define hierarchy with multiple ways. It doesn't have to be exactly this way. Uh, it could be depending on your type of industry, the exact function that you all are, are doing. The hierarchies can help, and the whole idea here is you can actually roll up all these data at at different levels of the hierarchy, uh, and uh, that that kind of uh, allows you to analyze how many work orders we have, how many failures we had, uh, how much labor hours are we spending on which type of asset category, what are my critical assets, uh, what are uh, where are we spending the most amount of money uh, in terms of uh, maintenance budget on uh, emergency problems or corrective maintenance all these can be done if we have a good uh, asset hierarchy and can roll up uh, with an asset hierarchy just another example but we can also have if in some companies uh, it is very important to have a component hierarchy and uh, if you are really maintaining certain asset especially a more expensive asset and critical assets it may be advisable to have a good uh, component hierarchy as well. So that will allow you to monitor you know, where we are having maximum uh, problems. Uh, and then if it's, again, another, another thing we noticed is on the PM, co, PM uh, itself, the PM categories, if we have it at a asset hierarchy level, it will also help you uh, in building relationship between failure and the PM uh, or it will also give you, uh, if when you attach an asset to a particular uh, in this hierarchy, then you know that that asset can be monitored in many, many ways. So we see these are the simple things, but can really help in analyzing data. There are some other challenges too. Uh, the, if, you, if we are using SAP for a long time, uh, then obviously our whole data is big and it, has, it grows over a period of time. And uh, the data processing becomes difficult. Uh, it's uh, it is an SAP is is not an uh, 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 an uh, the 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 data complexity is also there. The application has thousands and thousands of tables. It just becomes hard for average user to understand it. Uh, sometimes. Uh, Technical skills are not available, uh, which and the technical skills can be of multi multitude. You know, there could be database, application knowledge, uh, reporting knowledge, etc. So it becomes hard for us to uh, really uh, leverage all this data. In a SAP with BW and all these rest, we get some basic uh, infrastructure, but it's no way it's really designed for a comprehensive EAM analysis. So. Uh, it has some basic things. 
and it also need to integrate uh, sometimes it is in, uh, necessary to integrate the SAP with other systems other uh, uh, your SCADA systems maybe your other uh, criticality analysis systems or any of these uh, uh, PLC system that where you might uh, gather the meter data or things like that so which can help you uh, analyze the work orders uh, the corrective work orders with the actual uh, conditions etc um, and then most of these applications don't have the sophistication in in uh, in the way the data is visualized or presented so some of these are and then of course uh, as we said uh, see saw it in the poll uh, the versions upgrade, keeping up with the latest, it, it's just not uh, easy. Uh, so a lot of things change. Uh, so these are the some of the things we saw as a gap uh, in the information point of view. Uh, most of the time we get some operational reports, but getting a lot more OLAP or analytical reporting is not easy. We get something with BW, uh, but uh, ad hoc reporting is also a little limited. Uh, and uh, whatever we get basic KPIs uh, are may not be uh, sufficient to a particular business or a particular company depending on whatever their initiatives are they may like to monitor other things other metrics scorecards etc and there is no formal performance management obviously so this is what we saw as uh, the information the information needs of different uh, uh, jobs are are different and you know, at an executive level, they would like to see only the big picture, the dashboard. They want the ability to drill down to a to metrics and go to a, a detailed report, etc. And we, we saw a different needs for each of these personas, and it's just not designed for that. So I have another question, Terry. Last question, okay. I'm promise. Here we go. What reporting data analysis software do you primarily use for your SAP, PM, or EAM? Do you use um, APAB4, SAP BW, Crystal, BO, or other? We're going to give it, everybody's jumping on here pretty good. We're going to give it five more seconds. Interesting. And we'll share those results with you here. 7% um, are using uh, ABAP4, 29% um, are using SAP Business BW, Business Warehouse, 7% um, Crystal BO, 57%, the largest single block, are saying other. Okay, so probably Excel or some other. Yes, Excel. We did a, a best practice report, and it identified 91% are using Excel in conjunction right. with. Right, right. And uh, that's that's that kind of brings the point here that it, it just uh, most of the time people feel comfortable with Excel because they are familiar with it and uh, and that's what we have seen. But it has its own challenges and uh, that's that's the interesting part. Uh, so what we wanted to do today was kind of share you know how we can. Uh, uh, what what are our options actually in analyzing this data? Uh, SAP uh, has bought, uh, as most of you know, uh, business objects. And business objects before SAP bought was actually bought crystal decisions. So, uh, and there were some lot of other products also they bought. So business objects per se has a lot of uh, different uh, technologies in it that can be leveraged. Uh, primarily Excel CS, Crystal, and the you know their traditional BO desktop too. So what we have seen is in the last about three to five years, uh, there is a there is a lot of changes in how data can be analyzed and visualized. A uh, lot of flash charting, a lot of context sensitive information mashup ability where you can see. Uh, for example, if I want to do a planning uh, and I want to see my estimated labor hours and how did I do it, but at the same time I also want to see some data from my time and attendance system, which in some companies might be some other system other than SAP, but you want to see that together. Or you also want to see some other oil analysis data along with uh, failure data. So 
some of those things have become a lot more easier now than what they used to be a uh, few years ago. Uh, this whole visualization part uh, has really helped interacting with the data. Uh, so for example, you can take a particular report and you can drill it down. All this while you don't have to be connected to the SAP at all. These tools are a lot more uh, capable and a lot more uh, functional in that sense where whatever we do it in Excel by copying, creating graphs, doing all the rest of it can be actually automated. It can save a lot of your time uh, on monthly or a weekly basis if you are spend you know creating any weekly, monthly or quarterly reports or and then there are you know repetitive tasks can be automated. There will always be some uh, uh, ad hoc reporting need, but there is always uh, some of these things you that are repetitive can be automated. and most of these tools have become a lot more sophisticated. so, the, the, the main point here is uh, to understand that there is a lot of options now than what we had a few years ago. And uh, SAP is heavily investing into this uh, to make it a lot more easier. Uh, one thing uh, we also noticed is the data model itself is for an average user can be extremely difficult to understand. So there is a need to kind of make it e easy on the average users or a power user. So there can be some upfront work that can be done that will make it uh, easy for the uh, users to interact with the data. So now let's look at some of the problems that can be solved with, uh, with data. And uh, obviously uh, maintenance is all about engineering in many cases. So. Uh, you know, some are engineering problems and some are management problems and some engineering management problems. So we'll, we'll just, uh, uh, just touch on some of these issues. Let's look at asset performance management. Um, if, if we have um, thousands and tens of thousands of assets all over the place, how do I find out which are underperforming assets? Uh, how do we find um, you know, the performance, uh, if I make a strategic change, am I getting my failures are going down or my downtime is, uh, is reducing? Uh, you want to also know what my assets are due for replacement in let's say next three years or next 24 months and uh, how do I really make a repair versus replace decisions? Uh, some of these things uh, are done with the experience and some are done on a gut feeling, some are done on, uh, but what we believe is, you know, if you, those decisions can still be made with the, uh, with, with the experience, et cetera, but that can be also supported by some data analysis. Uh, a lot of times black and white decisions are easy uh, and then there are some shades of gray that makes it very difficult for us to decide whether we should repair this particular piece of equipment or we are better off uh, uh, making uh, or, or replacing. So we all, some of the companies have run to fail strategies on some of the equipments, uh, which, is, which, which can work, but if you have an expensive equipment and more critical equipment, uh, then you might look at uh, some options how to actually arrive at a certain criteria by which you will decide that at this time, this time, if it meets all these criteria, we will not repair it and we'll just replace it. So some of those strategies can be defined. Uh, let's look at work management. I think most of us are always involved uh, into uh, work management. There is always the, um, where do I we focus our work? How much proactive work uh, are we doing uh, versus reactive? Uh, and that kind of highlights how the organization is performing. Uh, we also like to know what is my work volume, what is my cost involved, what is time, material, all of that. And that kind of gives you, we, we can actually understand based on the work order types that we have or by different months or by do we have seasonality, we have shutdowns, you know, what do we, what do, we do before the shutdown, what do we do after the shutdown, during the shutdown, all of that. So some of these things just 
the sheer amount of work that we have, understanding, getting that big picture, uh, only data can actually solve. Uh, then obviously we all want to know whether are we doing it efficiently. Uh, we have a certain type of work, uh, certain type of uh, preventive maintenance code. Uh, you know, we do it every time on hundreds of equipment. Are, do we have a good uh, averages uh, time that it takes? Uh, are we able to ensure that uh, the people who are doing this work are in the same vicinity? If somebody is, you know, 95% above that, then um, or below that. Uh, you would like to know why he's uh, able to do it quicker than others and if there are some people who take more than the average then you would like to know why are they taking longer. Is there any training issue? Is there any uh, uh, issue related to a particular location? Things like that can be analyzed. Uh, then obviously there are a lot of work orders which are kind of in the problem zone where uh, work gets started, it is not, it's in progress for a long time, some are cancelled, so some are reworked. So you, you would like to monitor some, those types of work orders at an organization level, at a department level, um, or however you all are, or, uh, however you are uh, organized in with, within your uh, company. The other problems, and in the, I'm just giving some examples because uh, there are so many other business problems we can list. Uh, but some of these, uh, like in planning and scheduling, uh, if somebody is trying to plan, we just would like to know what my current volume, what is my backlog, uh, what is my forelog, or if we are doing a PM look ahead report, you would know what your PMs are. If we are touching our equipment, uh, then might as well finish the PM as, while we are on working on it. So some of those things can be actually uh, analyzed uh, while we are planning and scheduling. Uh, also whether planners are doing their, their job well, you can actually monitor their uh, uh, efficiencies and you know, also figure out whether our planning compliance is uh, in line. Uh, so there are so many little things that can be managed uh, and as a problem, uh, as, a, as an organization, most of the time we would like to know where my bottlenecks are, which areas I can improve upon, which areas uh, we have problems uh, that can be uh, addressed if we know it uh, well in advance. So some of these things only data analysis can help. On the reliability side, uh, obviously we can use a lot of uh, uh, failure analysis, uh, we can use a lot of uh, uh, data that will be available for the downtime, etc., and calculate the availability on critical equipment. Um, if we are, we change certain uh, reliability uh, uh, strategies. We want to see how the reliability growth is, uh, and then manage these. Uh, uh, understand the risk involved in the failure of critical equipment, and there are some statistical techniques that one can use uh, to actually. Uh, judge or uh, calculate or compute some of the risk. Uh, failure analysis is another big area uh, where if you want to have a failures uh, consistently, if you are monitoring, you can actually identify which failures are taking most of your time uh, in terms of labor hours, in terms of downtime, or which problem codes or you know where where are we spending money. Uh, so you can do a kind of 80-20 analysis which then you can focus on some of those uh, failures and uh, try to solve them. Um, then of course we all would like to project the maintenance cost for the quarter, for the year so that you can actually uh, put it in the budget. So there are some statistical techniques as well as some historic data that you can plot and see how the trend is and uh, can come up with some uh, budgeting figures. Uh, then uh, there are some unusual failures and you can actually find out from statistical analysis uh, and statistics uh, has been used for a long, long time as we all use all these drugs which are administered uh, during the clinical trials. They use statistics to make a decision on whether the drug is effective or not and some of those techniques can also be used. In, in understanding the failures and what the pattern of the failures are and whether we have any unusual cases. Um, 
and then of course uh, if we are doing any root cause analysis uh, we can actually figure out uh, what is really uh, the root causes and what the cost of that uh, cause is. So uh, some of those things uh, can be analyzed uh, with the help of data. Uh, again I have some other examples. Uh, what are my impactful failures which are causing, uh, which has a direct impact on the reliability, downtime, uh, etc. Uh, where are we, uh, sometimes we can predict what the next failure will be based on statistical analysis uh, and that can be augmented with the engineering uh, help uh, because most of the time engineers would know based on their experience and they can actually uh, so the statistics can help identify potential risk and then the engineering group can go and evaluate them whether that has a relevance or not. Uh, we can also determine what the mean time between failure is based on various techniques. Uh, we can also uh, identify the uh, repeat failures and rework and that is that can really help in solving some of the uh, normal problems that we have. Uh, there are other areas, uh, but I'll just touch on spare parts because uh, that's in uh, most of the most of us have a lot of inventory associated with uh, spare parts, and some is is very old, uh, very slow moving, or sometimes non moving at all for three months, or three years, or five years. We don't have anything moving, so you would you would like to know what that is, and that's really uh, one of the uh, areas that can reporting can help you identify. Uh, then uh, there are a lot of spare parts cost, the carrying cost, uh, holding cost, uh, spillage is there. Uh, so you would like to know what is uh, how the, your spare parts are being used. And then of course we all want to know what my minimum is, what's my max is and then uh, reorder levels uh, we want to determine. And that can be tied with the actual uh, reliability goals. And uh, so there are some techniques by which you can actually tie the reliability goals with the spare parts levels. Uh, then obviously the last thing uh, as an example here is we can forecast the demand which can help you uh, identify uh, your budgeting needs as well as your buying or the ordering pattern which can also give you reordering. Uh, you can optimize the order point as well. So let's look at all these things and I didn't touch some other areas uh, but uh, just in the interest of time I, I'll just uh, summarize some of the things that we discussed. At an organization level we all have some sort of goals uh, and these are just sample or examples of goals. We might have other types of goals. So we want to reduce total cost of asset ownership. We want to increase uh, uh, availability, reliability, reduce energy cost, extend assets life lifespan. Uh, you want to reduce EHS and compliance risk. Uh, maybe labor is an issue from a costing perspective. So, so there could be different different examples, and these are our business objectives, and they have a direct impact on our maintenance and reliability activities. So obviously we all have some strategies in place or we may devise a certain strategy based on uh, experience, based on certain information that you might have and that, that in itself can be provided by a lot of data analysis and you might come up with some strategy and you might have some already some initiatives in place, uh, RCM, CBM, uh, ISO, etc. Obviously you have a lot of subject matter within maintenance management and currently you are managing it with SAP. Uh, you want to manage asset life cycle, work management, planning, scheduling, uh, compliance, PM, PDM. So there are so many different subject matter that we, we actually manage within SAP. And um, they, they, SAP acts here as a transaction system which gathers all these data. We will also have some other related data sources, uh, asset related data sources. So some engineering information, some meter data, uh, sometimes uh, some companies have inspection data as a, in another application or you might have it in the SAP. And then we also have automation uh, data as well uh, that you might like to integrate if it, uh, it has a relevance to it. 
and then of course uh, SAP ERP also data might be there that you would like to bring it together. So what we believe is all this data, if we have a good quality uh, uh, data or we have some process in which we ensure the quality of this data and there is an integrity that you can, uh, you can rely on and then you can bring it all together. Now this doesn't have to be a BW or it can be logically you can bring it or you can bring it in BW or you might have some external data warehouse too or some data repository where you can bring all this data. And it doesn't have to be uh, at one time you have to do this all can be done uh, in, a, in a kind of incremental fashion as well. So depending on what subject matter problem that we all are trying to address, you can actually decide how, how to get this information together. And once you have all this together, this data, you can actually start using some sort of data modeling. Uh, here the meaning of data modeling is more is really defining a problem and how the data can be used to solve that problem. Uh, if we have, uh, then you can create uh, some uh, metrics, uh, alerts or scorecards or dashboards. So there are different ways the information can be actually uh, shown to different users or can be provided to different users to, uh, so it, it's the essentially it's an actionable information, information that can be readily used. Um, in our earlier survey, we, we a lot of people use Excel or some other sources and they probably try and uh, do some additional things and uh, then get to the, uh, the the information that they need. So this can be actually brought all together and some of it can be automated as well. So the idea here is once you have all these things together, uh, you can monitor the performance of uh, all your efforts, uh, whatever strategy that you have in place, uh, all the asset related uh, initiatives that you may have. Uh, you can actually monitor the performance and as classically it is said, uh, what you measure is what you can control and what you can control is what you can manage. So uh, I think that's a core, uh, you know, part of performance management and I, uh, that, that, that helps you uh, in coming up with uh, revising your strategy, revising your goals and all this process continues uh, as a part of continuous process improvement. So this is not a static game. All of this keeps changing as time goes by. As you improve one area, you might take up on another area and you, you will repeat this whole, this is an iterative process that you might follow. So this is in nutshell, you know, what we believe uh, that will help uh, you move from you know reactive maintenance to proactive maintenance uh, and then of course uh, we have other techniques for predictive maintenance that can be uh, that can be uh, supported with uh, data analysis and in the end really the goal is to reach to a maintenance optimization and uh, that's that's what data can help you with along with your other initiatives uh, one, one important thing here is um, the data analysis alone cannot do uh, optimization, but data analysis can certainly assist with all your other initiatives that you might have. And uh, that's the whole purpose. And again, uh, just to bring it up together, you, we all have a lot of data. Uh, so we want to bring it together, put it together in such a way that it creates some picture. Uh, that, that kind of helps us. Uh, get an insight into a problem, get some actionable information and uh, eventually make informed decisions. So that's, that's the goal. So what I'm going to do is uh, show you some examples uh, and I, I know we are uh, kind of uh, getting close to the uh, one hour here. So I'm going to show some examples that I have uh, and we will start with very simple uh, example here, maybe uh, you cannot view, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just make it big. So very simple, I think some of these type of reports you already get, uh, but the point I want to drive here is uh, some of these things presentation wise was very difficult in previous uh, versions of Crystal or ABAP4 or BW, etc. So some of these things have been 
uh, can be presented very well here. As you can see, the same type of work orders, overdue work orders or approved work orders, you would know from a priority standpoint as well as you want to know from a aging standpoint. So actually uh, the idea here is to uh, get to a point where uh, you, you can analyze and you can drill through this. So if I click on this, I can actually uh, go to the uh, uh, a report that is that will provide me a list of all the work orders uh, that are in that category. And then here, actually, we can uh, we can click on the work order number and then go to the actual work order too. So some of these uh, interactivity really helps. Uh, in solving the problems uh, when we are in the meetings or uh, status meetings or we are talking to uh, a group of people. So if we go another example for uh, costing related or labor hours uh, related. So here is an example where we would like to understand what is my labor cost, what is material cost, uh, what is my tool cost or if you are if you in some cases have a, a, an external service provider. Uh, then you can actually monitor for each work order and you can group some of these work orders based if you have a project type of work orders you can actually uh, do group it together and then uh, do summaries at different levels. Uh, also uh, one of the th examples here is uh, all of us have work orders, a lot of backlogs. You want to know if you have a, a culture of scheduling for a, for a week you want to know how many work orders uh, were scheduled for the period, how many were really completed. Uh, then want to know how many backlog aging is and really how many work orders were cancelled. So some of these KPIs uh, can be done for different set of uh, work order types. Uh, so if, if I have a work order for PM, then I may also like for safety, I would like to know for environment, you know, those types of things. So we have seen some of these KPIs can help you uh, in determining your uh, performance itself. So uh, let's look at another. Uh, you want to forecast your PMs. You know, if we are working on a piece of equipment, you would also like to know what we are going to do for the next uh, three months, six months, uh, etc. And if you have multiple PMs, you may like to group it together, and uh, that that something can be done with the help of a PM forecast or look ahead type of report. And this can be done at an equipment level so that or a location level. And once you have all these things, you can actually look at it from a summary point of view where you will get it for a PM for the based on business unit, based on site, depending on how you all are organized. But that's really the idea. And in this particular example, uh, I'm showing you all PDFs, but really you can actually make it a drill through. So from here you can actually go to the list of work orders and then review it further. So uh, there is a lot of interactivity that is available. Uh, if we want to post it on the notice board, you know, all these type of weekly schedule or a monthly schedule, uh, we can actually do that. Uh, that and sometimes you can do a daily schedule. So that kind of gives a sense uh, what is what is actually planned for that uh, particular period. Uh, if we can actually also compare how many are schedule hours and how many are available hours. So the available hours can come from uh, time and attendance system and in some uh, and then can be uh, viewed it in such a way so that planner can do a good job of planning or a supervisor would know all his people and can group it like that. Uh, so the other thing we have uh, seen is people want to do exceptional reporting. They want to know uh, what are my top 10 cost in last 360, which equipment is costing me more in terms of maintenance. And then you can actually focus on that equipment. Here this example is showing all the work orders for that particular centrifugal pump, but you can actually go through a lot more details of that. Uh, Again, similar example, uh, it, these are more based on uh, corrective maintenance that you might have done on a piece of equipment. So you want to know these assets. So some of these ranking methodology helps identify uh, some of the problem areas within the organization. And as you can see, these all these things can be linked to the actual work orders and you know, they can be listed further. So 
some of these techniques can really help uh, get to the uh, to the to the uh, equipment that needs uh, your uh, attention from the supervisor or a manager. This is another example of uh, of inventory where uh, you want to know the inventory turn, uh, you know which inventory or which spare parts are turning more. And at the, on the same ground, you will also like to know which is not uh, turned at all. So some of these things can help uh, in, in identifying uh, slow moving items. Then there are some you know, regular reports that you might have. Uh, so calibration, et cetera. So the other things, uh, uh, let me also show you some other example which are a little bit on the statistical side which may not be able to do it with crystal or BO at this time. There are some other tools that can help you uh, manage uh, some of those reporting. This is an example of a maintenance excellence dashboard and this may look little pretty and uh, may look uh, more graphic but really it has a lot of KPIs on it and they are grouped uh, from a, a logical standpoint and as a manager or as a uh, supervisor you would like to kind of understand where we are based on your goals and this from here, you can actually click and go to the details for, for each one of these KPIs. So this is really designed, on the left side we are showing all these asset availability. It, it is uh, more onto the failures, etc. Uh, all, whatever I'm showing really it is all, lot of it is feasible within, uh, within crypto and any other tool that you might have. So it's really, some of it can be built in Excel also, which can be automated. Uh, this is an interesting example, another technique uh, which is used, uh, there is a tool called SAS that can be used to come up with something called heat map. So if, you, if I have hundreds of pumps in a particular location and I want to know, uh, I want to monitor based on a particular problem, I want to know uh, operation hours and if there is any relationship uh, with operation hours and uh, uh, total cost or mean time between failures or, uh, or uh, any other criteria that you might have. So uh, some of these things uh, can be done uh, with the help of uh, heat map. Uh, then uh, we talked earlier about repair versus replace model. How do I decide, you know, at what point uh, I, I replace an equipment. So there are some techniques that can be followed. Uh, so uh, these are the areas. Uh, again, there are some uh, outliers if you want to find, if you have a total maintenance cost, if you're monitoring for a particular type of work order or a PM work order, at any point in time it goes beyond that 5% interval, then you can actually go and identify why. In, in this example, everything seems to be good, but if there was any work order which took more than the average, then uh, you can actually set an alert, etc. So some of these things are feasible. Uh, you, you, if you have few types of work orders, uh, sorry, failure codes, uh, and you have a work order data, we can use viable analysis and figure out, you know, how you can extend the life of the asset by eliminating certain types of failures. And uh, this may assist with your engineering group who can then decide whether they should uh, figure out a way to eliminate those uh, type of failures. Another simple example could be failure data which can uh, you know, identify failure code and number of failures. And we can do it for downtime or cost or uh, MTBF and identify which failures are really taking most of your time. In this case, 85% of the time, the first two are uh, causing problems. So uh, as a maintenance manager, uh, we can focus on those areas than other areas. So I, as I said, I have a lot of different uh, examples, but in the interest of time, uh, I, Terry, I'll just uh, get some questions. So uh, so I actually, uh, because I, I think uh, I had one last slide I would uh, like to share and see uh, and then go to some of the questions. So how do we get there? Uh, so these are the 10 steps. Uh, we, I think it will help uh, uh, people, uh, companies to get to a data-driven asset reliability and maintenance. 
Um, and uh, strong leadership, uh, good with a vision and resolve to overcome the practical problems. Uh, we always have to start small, uh, establish uh, the business case, prove it that it can be solved, and um, kind of over the year, uh, over a period of time, build on that and get everybody uh, involved in this process. Uh, along the way, it is always good to build some sort of standardization taxonomy across organizations uh, that helps uh, in, in analyzing data. And then we talked about data analysis in the survey also. We, we kind of have a mixed uh, uh, feeling here. So over a period of time, uh, we, can, uh, we can put certain things in place that can help improve the quality of the data. Uh, then, of course, there is always going to be some sort of investment that has to happen in the analytics infrastructure uh, that can help uh, the shop floor people as well as uh, people in the reliability or higher ups uh, to, to actually see the value of the data. Uh, then we also think that some of these KPIs, dashboards uh, need to be developed, used, and as, as you will progress, uh, there will be different initiatives. The dashboard will keep changing, scorecards will change, uh, some of your business problems will change, and they need to be, uh, they need to evolve over a period of time. Uh, you have to probably integrate some of the data from other uh, initiatives that you might have and link it with SAP PM so that you, you, you can find some correlationship between the oil analysis, vibration analysis, whether that is reducing your uh, work or uh, failures and uh, corrective maintenance, etc. Then, of course, you have to allocate good budget or certain budget effort. Train, uh, training is another issue we have seen really, really can help uh, uh, involve most of the organization in uh, using data. And then ultimately, obviously, that whole thing will lead into building a culture of uh, making data-driven decisions. So we believe these are the steps that can help you start the game. And then it's a long journey, uh, and uh, then uh, you will start seeing the results of it. So Terry, what I'll do is uh, take some questions. Terrific. Um, so now, what do you find, you know, in, in terms of you know reality when you're out there as far as data quality from the clients that you're going in? I mean, is we hear often, you know, and here there was a 50-50 mix in the poll question, but we hear from the people that we deal with when when we really get down to it that their data is not very good and they feel very frozen that right. they 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 you know. They want to spend a lot of time going back and trying to fix the data and and um, uh, things of that nature. Can you you know can you comment a little bit about what your experience sure. is and what you can do even when the data isn't quite as good as what people might want it to be? Right. I think that's a great question because that is a problem everybody or most of the organizations are facing because we inherited a lot of data over the years that may not have gathered in a certain fashion. That is. Uh, analytic uh, analysis ready or analysis friendly. So what we think, uh, one of the step is, uh, and this problem is not something that can be solved with uh, one switch on and off type of situation. It will, it will have to be solved over a period of time. And the the best way to start is start with a problem, business problem where you can get maximum benefit as far as organization is concerned. And start cleansing some of the data that, or first of all, start getting good data for the current uh, time onwards so that, you know, you can uh, gather it for three months and see uh, the, you know, analyze it. And as far as past data is concerned, some of the data, there are good data quality tools are available. Some tools are very intelligent. A uh, lot of times we enter a lot of data into text fields, you know, some notes, et cetera. So now there are a lot of good tools available that can help uh, in cleansing some of that data. Uh, but you know there is no magic uh, wand here that can solve uh, this problem. It, it needs to be solved over a period of time. Excellent. Let me see what else we got here. Um, what do you find, you know, in the off-the-shelf reports for SAP? Are you, are you finding those are useful for for SAP PM? Are you are you you know do you find that they have a utility when it comes to managing maintenance and decision support? Uh, yeah, some of it 
can be used, uh, but a lot of times uh, it really depends on your particular setup, how you are organized or how you, what is important to you. So some of these off the shelf can be a good starting point and they can be further modified to suit your particular requirement. Uh, and, and this will all change based on what what that business issue that you are trying to monitor or address or uh, trying to solve. So, so the short answer is yes, you can use some of it, is, but that may need to be uh, refined or tailored to your need a little bit. What do you What do you guys do? So somebody somebody says, "Gee, I'm interested." You seem to know, you know, what you're doing when it comes to SAP reporting, and we we have an idea of what we want to get out, but we can't get out um, right now. What's the process like for working with Reporting House? Uh, we generally uh, we start uh, with uh, as discussed. We start with a business issue that might be uh, that they are trying to solve the information that they are trying to get. Uh, we then define what what the information needs are. Once that is done, then we we generally use whatever the infrastructure they have in place, uh, whether they are using ABF or they are using a Crystal or uh, whatever the tool might be in place. If they don't have any tool, then then we may recommend something that they may need to get. But by and large, uh, once they define the need, uh, what the information that they require, then we can help them build whatever that report that they are looking for. So the process would be ideally to understand the requirement. So we have a lot of library of reports that we kind of give them to, to, to help uh, focus on certain business area and define the need, uh, define the requirements, and then kind of help them build the report. So many times uh, SAP uh, is, it gives Crystal or BO as part of SAP in the newer uh, releases. So, uh, so I think the tools may not be a big problem, so it's all going to be how to actually implement it. So we, we have a lot of experience and we have a lot of library of reports that we can reuse or customize it for that 